captured in our wastewater treatment systems. They, they go right through, end up in Long Island Sound, and have the potential to accumulate in fish or crustaceans or other sorts of things. But by a combination of, of uh, targeted regulation and, and statute and consumer choice and consumer changes, I think this is an issue that um, Connecticut is gonna sh has shown some leadership on. Good job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> there we go. I got one back. Yeah, yeah, for me. yeah, I got you back there. Let's get our next question going, all right? Let's do that. Hello. Uh, my name is James Horbury, and I'm a junior here. And this question is for Commissioner Klee. Commissioner, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service began a program to restore the Atlantic salmon population in the Connecticut River Basin in 1967. And in 2013, they ended the 45-year effort to restore wild Atlantic salmon to the Connecticut River watershed. Only a state-funded legacy program remains. Recently, there were salmon found spawning upstream, naturally, in the Farmington watershed. Do you think that the salmon would be able to independently continue spawning upstream with the discontinuation of the federal salmon raising efforts? Uh, it, it's a great question, and you highlight a, a real sort of special event, this discovery of a, a salmon that, that was following its sort of natural sort of drive and came all the way back up to Farmington to actually spawn and have a successful spawning. Uh, I think it hasn't occurred in almost 100 years in, in Connecticut, uh, which is uh, remarkable. It's actually a sign of the health and the cleanliness of our waters, the efforts we've been doing to remove dams. I'm not optimistic, though, that the one salmon, or I think it was actually a few salmon that actually made it all the way back to nest. That doesn't mean we're going to suddenly see the historic sort of levels of, of salmon run that we, we used to have. But it is, a, it is part of our, our uh, agency's uh, mission and uh, the things we're doing across the spectrum for fisheries, particularly these types of fisheries that spend part of their life in saltwater, part of their life in freshwater. The dams that we built here in Connecticut during our uh, industrial revolution you know, hundreds of years ago are impediments to the movement of fish back up upstream. So that's one of the main goals of our wildlife folks. Um, we've actually here in Woodbridge, the Pond Lily Dam, if you want to go down, it's uh, kind of where Whaley uh, splits down by the, uh, uh, the Walgreens down there. I'm being very hyper-local right, right now, but it's actually worth going up and taking a look at that dam. We removed a dam there to encourage the fish passage to move upstream there, address some flooding concerns. So these sorts of things are happening all around the state, and the signs of healthy rivers are rivers where fish can get up and have, uh, do those, sort of, those, those major runs back and forth from uh, saltwater to freshwater. We do have a, a, a major run of fish on the Connecticut, which is the shad uh, uh, come and go. Uh, and, and that's been successful and is part of our uh, long-term history in, in the state of Connecticut. And, and I, 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 uh, I was happy to read about the salmon when, when they were discovered, and let's, ho let's hope. And that's really the importance of clean water, is to, to have rivers that are fishable, swimmable, and where ecosystems can, can thrive. Thrive. Absolutely. Let's get our next question going. Hello. Uh, hi, my name is Jacob Leibowitz, and I am a senior here, and my question is for Governor Malloy. Uh, Tropical Storm Irene and Storm Sandy caused widespread power outages and flooding, sewer plant failures, and major water pollution issues for tens of millions of people. Many climate scientists warn such violent weather events are likely to become increasingly common in the future. What is Connecticut doing to prepare for future storms? Well, we're doing a lot, um, uh, including going after federal money to uh, strengthen our ability to uh, overcome and, and uh, uh, storms, uh, to change our building codes, uh, to acquire more uh, uh, tidal uh, uh, properties to make sure that they're protected. Uh, so we're, we're, at, we're, we're at this all the time. In fact, we even have a center at the University of Connecticut uh, uh, devoted to this very issue. Uh, how, how, do we, how do we properly prepare ourselves for the future? There's other things on the energy side, uh, such as microgrids, where we're making sure that there will be power sources for a community um, that would survive the challenges of an Irene or a Sandy or, or other challenges. So this is a very comprehensive approach. Uh, we have a lot of departments working on it. It's not, uh, not just uh, deep, but, but uh, much of state government that's concentrating on this particular, uh, particular issue. And quite frankly, uh, a couple of days don't go by uh, in any given uh, uh, week that we're not talking about some aspect of, of this. And I would just add that uh, uh, resiliency is, is a key focus of, of that uh, Connecticut Institute for Resilience and Climate Adaptation. Um, Woodbridge